again why we're not using Node.js. Um, I actually initially, until an hour ago, I had this title as, so tell me again why you're not using Node.js, but that seemed a little uh, pushy. <laughs> and, uh, and really, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't be the one asking the question, right? Uh, it, it should be you as developers, you as team leads or CTOs or CEOs uh, to determine whether or not um, you should be. I'm, I'm here kind of to tell you that it's, it's not as bad as it looks and um, really to, to, to raise that question. So cool, thanks guys. Um, uh, so let's go. Uh, my name is Jordan Rousseau. Uh, here's some contact information that'll be at the end as well. Uh, I basically write code and hang out with my family. Uh, wife was taking the picture, so I'll give her a little props there. There's Doc McStuffins. Uh, there we go. I work at Weather Decision Technologies. Uh, we are a company uh, that was founded in 2000. I uh, have about 90 plus employees and growing. Uh, and we're on the South Research Campus at OU. We build systems and applications from all the way to just consumer websites to enterprises, all the way to foreign governments. Um, national weather services for foreign governments, if you will. Uh, we play with a lot of uh, really interesting weather data. And um, I have the uh, privilege to be able to you know, do some data visualization and, and fun stuff like that with them. <clears throat> so where do we use Node in production? We have three full stack web applications. Uh, that includes an e-commerce site, a consumer weather site, and an enterprise user portal. Uh, we have three event driven applications uh, where we're connecting to a RabbitMQ cluster and uh, receiving events, processing those and sending them out as oh, uh, emails or text messages, what have you. Uh, we have a static image renderer, which isn't that exciting. I don't know why I put it up there. But it's Node, so uh, I put it up there just to get one more bullet in there. Uh, so creating a map with weather data from, um, from tiles, from raster tiles. Uh, we have two uh, extremely high load APIs, uh, one being a, a real-time lightning API that's uh, running in Amazon. Uh, the back end is a Cassandra cluster. And we're running that on an Elastic Load Balancer instance. So um, that's pretty cool. We also have a package management API. I'll get into that uh, a little bit later. Uh, we also have uh, three or four, give or take a few, uh, applications in the pipeline. Uh, we've, as, as a web team, we've really uh, sold in on the concept of Node. And uh, we're, we're really trying to not to look back on, on anything. And, and any new development or prototypes, uh, we will build in Node. So what am I going to attempt to do today? Uh, first off, explain how WET, more specifically the web team, uh, made the decision to Node. Uh, show off some quick prototypes on how, how easy it is to really get this stood up uh, with some frameworks that, that I really like. Uh, and then uh, go through some common problems that you'll see when uh, starting up a Node. Show off some tools for running Node in production. Uh, show some tools that we use for continuous integration and deployment. And I'm really going to try not to completely trash other languages. Uh, I, I have the utmost respect for, for anybody that's developing in other languages. Uh, it, it may seem that I am. Uh, I, I'm really going to try to walk that fine line between telling you what, why we made the decision versus this, this language is bad. So, so please know that I, I, I really do appreciate other languages and, and uh, they all have their uses and they all have their needs in the world. Uh, but, but right now this is, this, is, this is our best solution that we've, we've found, Node is, and, and we're going to use that. So uh, just kind of explain that a little, little caveat. So uh, really start a conversation. That's, that's what I want to try to do. Um, Start maybe maybe a conversation with yourself. Maybe maybe start to question on okay maybe we should be using Node or or start a conversation with me on Twitter or email or what have you. Um, just just thinking about giving it a chance. I have one caveat. Uh, I am doing what I love to do. I, I go to work every day and get to do what I love to do. 
um, and I get to tell you about that. So that, that's a great privilege that I have. Uh, and I'm lucky enough to be doing this, but that by no means makes me an expert. Uh, I'm learning as I go. I learn every day. I learn every week. Um, I see code that I wrote a month ago and, and really hate it. So uh, don't, don't think of me as just this great expert, but I love what I do, and, and so I'm here to tell you about that. So, uh, so this is a quote from uh, Dustin Diaz. I bet on JavaScript a long time ago, and alas, like English, it's everywhere. For all its faults, for all of its malignment, JavaScript is everywhere. It, it, we're not going to get away from that anytime soon. Uh, especially if you do a lot of web development, you're going to find yourself using JavaScript. You're just going to have to. So uh, the, the thought is, you know, maybe you can, if, if you don't like it, Maybe you choose to give up on it. And, and more power to you. Um, TJ, uh, I'm not sure if you guys recall a, a nice little farewell to Node note on Medium, uh, the maintainer of Express and Mocha and just about any of the fun frameworks we were using at the time, uh, decided to leave Node for Go. That's, that's fine. Um, you could also choose to embrace it and improve upon it. That's, that's true for any language, really. So, so I'll, I'll try to get off my soapbox again. I live in JavaScript. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a really cool thing that I get to say. Uh, for the past two years, the entire team has been writing in JavaScript. Uh, sure, there's legacy code out there. Uh, we have PHP. We have Python running. But that's, that's, main, that's maintenance. I would say less than a percentage of a day a week. Uh, we have to go back into the depths of, of that old legacy code. But for the most part, to go into work and write in JavaScript, whether it's on the front end or the server side. And that's, that's an interesting concept to just start thinking about. You, you don't have to you know, switch those contexts. But uh, I digress a little bit. Uh, before, we were using ActionScript. Um, all of our client side stuff. So. Uh, we, we wrote a interactive mapping solution uh, for about oh, seven or so years uh, as a Flash application. And we wrote it in ActionScript. And so the comfort level of ActionScript was, was really nice. Um, just like any other language, it was serviceable. Uh, but now looking back on it, I think we held on to it for, for a little bit too long. Um, so, so what changed? Everybody knows Flash is dead, right? Um, I've been told this over and over. I, I really didn't want to believe it. It's like, no, 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 no. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be fine. Um, so let, let's go back to a little history lesson just for a little bit. Um, first off, you know, Apple, they were really hostile to Flash on the web. Steve Jobs came out with his open letter to, or thoughts on Flash uh, in April of 2010. There's never going to be any Flash on Apple devices. And uh, Flash was no longer pre-installed on the Macs uh, in 2011. Uh, Google, we, we use Google Maps for uh, the mapping APIs. And um, they started going towards JavaScript. Should have seen some sort of pattern, maybe. I don't know. Uh, in 2011, they deprecated their Flash Maps and then decided to charge for Google Maps. So that made us start thinking a little bit differently. Uh, Adobe, they really started moving away from Flash for specific development. Um, I went to an Adobe Max conference in 2011. And it was designer-centric, which is fine. That's great. I, I love Adobe products. But at the end of the day, they, they were not going to be supporting the development community as, as they had in the past. Um, Flex was put out uh, to pasture. Flex is kind of like a, it was a Flash uh, framework uh, that we used. And it was not the good kind of open source pasture like GitHub. It was, uh, we're just not going to worry about this anymore. Uh, this quote was really telling, in, in my opinion. We will continue making significant contributions to open web technologies like WebKit and jQuery. Um, not in the sense that they, they were making contributions to open source, but they, they thought jQuery was a really important part of the web. And that was, that was really telling, because you, you start to think, well, man, this gigantic company, that is kind of an interesting framework to think is part of the you know, big open web. There's, there's a lot more pieces of the open web than just jQuery. Um, 
HTML5. Everybody knows marketing just took on HTML5 like crazy and was pushing for something that was not Flash. We had to have HTML5. If you were in web development back then, you, you loved that. Uh, so we decided a little self-preservation -pre was, was needed and uh, throw the uh, veritable uh, raccoon out of down the stairs or something. So, um, so why am I telling you this? Uh, well, we, we moved to JavaScript. That was, that was our move. Obviously, it's client side. But in doing that, we started kind of looking at how can we improve the, the server side too. A lot of our server side scripts uh, had, I'll stop, I'll move over, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> so um, a lot of our server side PHP uh, was, was written specifically for Flash applications. And um, we figured we, we might want to look at a change in there. So, so there was a, a set, of, set of languages that, um, that we went through to kind of figure out what might work the best. Um, and so we'll kind of go through that. Then, and this is kind of where I might sound like I'm trashing, but I promise you, I'm um, kind of. Uh, so, so PHP. Uh, everybody on the team knew PHP. That was what our server side uh, um, code was written in. Uh, and um, and we had a lot of legacy code out there. And that kept us from really upgrading our versions from PHP and put us in a bind on, on what we could really use and utilize in that, in that world. Um, personally, I feel those frameworks are, are bloated uh, from time to time and, and, and can be quite a bit slow. Um, project structure can really turn into mush really quick. I mean, you can, you can just have flat PHP files along. I know you can build out. Uh, structured applications there, but in, in terms of what we've seen and what we were using, it was very messy. And uh, speaking of messy, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen PHP code that I really just thought, man, that is, that, that's pretty and you can re easily read that and maintain that kind of code. Um, complex error reportings, no stack traces uh, by default or for fatal errors, you just got to go into like uh, Apache logs to go find what went wrong uh, or outputting um, just a ridiculous amount of errors, um, I and I set errors or whatever. Uh, package management, and I got nothing on that. Uh, and then really our best option that we found was, was to use a Zen framework. So there was a proof of concept that was built out, but a lot of it just seemed really forced and a really um, not, not to what our expectations were and, and not to what we wanted to build. So uh, we could have used it, but, but it wasn't something that we would have been really proud of. So, so um, I read into a really good article, PHP, a fractal of bad design. Uh, a quote from that being, PHP is nothing but exceptions, and it's not OK when wrestling the language, when wrestling the language takes more effort than actually writing your program. My tools should not create net positive work for me to do. And I think that really says a lot about PHP. In my experience, I don't know about your experience, but in my experience, it, it, it's always been you're just fighting for the, uh, about these different little niches in the rules. And, and it, it started to get really, really frustrating. And after two years of development on PHP, uh, I was ready to get rid of it. Python. Uh, our other development team, major development team, was using Python quite a bit. They actually introduced. Uh, the usage of uh, Flask in, in the um, technology stack that we were using uh, is very nice, uh, very serviceable. Um, but at the end of the day, it seemed like we, uh, there was still going to be a good amount of learning curve. Uh, we, we had some good Python knowledge. We wrote some, some good stuff with Python. But Flask was a, a new concept, and, and getting that in there. Uh, it also seemed like you wrote a whole lot of boilerplate stuff just to, just to get something running. And so efficiencies was something that we were really concerned about, uh, especially for developers. You don't want to have to create this entire amount of boilerplate just to, just to get going. Um, another good read, uh, Python 3 is killing Python. Uh, that was another uh, worry. Uh, people either continue to write software in Python 2, or they pick another language did not shoot itself in the face. Um, that's a little harsh. I know, but if anybody uses Python, you know Python 3 is not, um, it's, it's not helping out Python's uh, 
um, argue or you know it's it, it's not helping them out at all and so uh, going towards Python for me at least was a non-starter just because we didn't really want to stick around with Python 2 we wanted to keep up to date but we couldn't that we couldn't justify the cost of going to Python 3 and, and porting over all of those packages out there. Uh, .NET. So I've been, I, I mentioned .NET not because uh, it was a real consideration for us, uh, but it's because enterprises in Oklahoma City are married to it. Uh, I, I don't know what's going on. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's good reason. I, I, I don't have a problem with that. It's a very good language. It's very powerful. Not language. .NET is not a language platform. Uh, it's a powerful platform. But it just, it, it's not for us. We were a, um, a LAMP Pi um, stack, if you will. Um, so adding a .NET stack is really not something that we could do. And, and at the end of the day, I, I saw a really good article on um, uh, the CEO Friday, why we don't hire .NET programmers. Uh, that was the uh, Expensify CEO. That's uh, actually a very entertaining piece because they actually are hiring .NET programmers now for Windows development. Uh, so there's a little bit of foot and mouth, but, but he makes some good points on it's really designed to tightly integrate uh, with and seamlessly extend the Microsoft stack and ex extremely powerful ways. But it's not something that you can go in and, and hack yourself. You, you can't go in there and, and really build upon that for yourself. You're, um, he made an analogy to um, cheeseburgers. And uh, it, it, you go in and you cook your cheeseburgers. You know how to cook your cheeseburgers. So um, that's, that's not saying .NET programmers aren't smart, because they are. I'm saying that. Um, you have these set things of do, uh, to do, and, and that's kind of the step you do. Uh, for, for other languages, it just didn't seem to, um, it, it, it didn't vibe it for me. So um, on this quote, .NET is designed to extend, not to disrupt. Um, I think that, that speaks some volumes that, that we're not, we weren't wanting here to just like go on with the same old, same old. We wanted to change how we thought about the server-side development, right? So, uh, okay, I'm done with all that stuff. So, so when you're trying to sw uh, switch, when you're trying to convince someone, what, what do you have to do to say, okay, well, we really shouldn't use this language, right? Uh, any language has its problems. If you just say all these negatives without any context, nobody's going to believe you. Nobody's going to trust you. They're just going to say, well, you know, you just don't like the language. That's, that's your problem. Other people can use it. And I, I said before, uh, any language has its merit. Uh, if it's being used out there, there's, there's reasons for that. Um, so, so it's not, don't, you, you can't just say, this is, this is bad, and so we can't use it. Um, you have to really find, how, does, how, how do the negativities really outweigh the positives of, of, an, of a language? Uh, cost benefit um, of, of moving to a language or sticking with a language really should be considered. Um, and, and really and truly, trolling other languages do not help at all. Um, it, it just doesn't. And I, I, um, I was worried about getting into that, that realm, and I, I hope I didn't. But um, I, I think respect is something that we really need in, in the, uh, across the languages. Um, so so there, there's some thoughts there. Uh, why, how, how can you go in and talk about the positives? How do you talk up a language to convince someone to use it? Um, any change from a widely used language without your within your company um, is going to have to be explained and explained thoroughly. Um, there's always a cost with changing, uh, with either um, building up uh, developer knowledge, uh, training. Um, if if you're on uh, stuff uh, servers, old old servers or something, you might have to upgrade machines or, or do something like that. Uh, there's always going to be costs and, and time. Um, and so you're really never going to convince anybody by just saying, well, you know, this company did it. Uh, I saw this guy at, at uh, Thunder Plains, and he says he uses it, so why can't we use it? You've got to say, OK, this is, this is why it's good for the company. This is why it's going to end up saving us money. This is why our developers are going to be 
uh, more productive with this framework. Um, another thing that should be considered is developer enjoyment. Um, if, if you as a developer enjoy what you're doing, I think you put out probably a lot more uh, good quality code and uh, at, a, at a lot faster pace. Not to say that you have to be fast in, in developing things, but I know for me, I, if I find something that I love to do, I'll work on it nonstop. And I, I really just dig in there and, and, and start to understand what's going on. So if you enjoy the language, uh, then I think that's something else that you need to be con uh, considerate of when, when trying to convince someone or convince a, a group of people. So why Node? Uh, personally, I think the Node community is incredible. Uh, if, you're, if you're on Twitter and you, you start to follow the, the, the big names in, in Node that have, that have worked on Node Core or core components of, of frameworks out there or um, of, say, NPM or anything like that, you start to see how, how amazing the, um, the community is. Um, and really and truly, uh, uh, help is a, a tweet or examples on Joyent developer sites or any other developer site uh, away. Uh, th there's a lot of information. You don't have to troll Stack Exchange or uh, W3 schools or anything like that. There's, there's a lot of very good, very technical um, information out there on Node. Package management, I think, is probably the best that's out there. Uh, I think, I think one of the reasons why Node is so popular is NPM. Uh, if it wasn't for that, uh, it would be a, a, a big mess. It would probably just be um, kind of like, uh, is it Bower, um, where you just pull from GitHub, basically. Um, so so I, think, I think NPM has really helped the, the uh, Node stay where it is. Um, there's less context switching for developing on the, on the uh, server side and client side. Uh, there's, there's a lot less time that you have to spend to really think about what language you're developing in if you're just jumping back and forth from uh, server side to client side JavaScript. There's still concepts that you have to think about differently, but you don't have to completely switch, OK, I'm going from JavaScript to PHP or JavaScript to Python. There, there's a lot. Um, uh, there's a lot more, I don't know, thought processes in your head that you don't have to just completely throw out when you uh, switch back from client side to server side. Uh, don't repeat yourself application programming is almost forced upon you. Uh, the, the concept of modules and, and being able to uh, write these tiny modules that do uh, small tasks for you and including them everywhere, requiring them everywhere. Um, is, a, is a very good concept, and it's a, it's a way for you to save time in development. Uh, you can share code between front and back end of a web application. Uh, Browserify does, uh, reinforces this usability uh, very well. And um, you can use a lot of the node that doesn't have C++ bindings or uh, some, some funky stuff in there in, in the browser, using Browserify. Um, I did a talk about that at OKCJS a while back, so if you jump on GitHub, you can go find that presentation. Um, a web developer with zero node experience will acclimate herself or himself if she or he has known JavaScript from web development. It's just, it's just how it is. I mean, you, sure, it's, it's scary to get in there and, and know that you're running server-side code, but at the end of the day, it's JavaScript. If you know JavaScript, you know JavaScript. So, so understanding that. Uh, another thing is, uh, uh, here's, a, here's a quote uh, from uh, Bill Scott at, at PayPal. Two new hires this week. Different teams in my organization got acclimated to code base and checked in first commit in less than four hours. In 2011, this took two weeks. <coughs> or this took weeks, sorry. Um, I, think, I think when you're going into JavaScript development and you're writing good code, you can really uh, share that code and have someone understand it very quick, especially if they understand JavaScript. I think, um, I think this is true for any language, but uh, uh, very much so with JavaScript. How? So how do you even get the nerve to go up and ask your boss or ask your CEO, I guess if your CEO is your boss or, or what have you, uh, how do you get permission? How, how, what, what do you do? Um, 
I say get permission or maybe not um, to build a prototype of a small portion uh, of either a legacy application or some very uh, simple CRUD application. Um, make sure the prototype is written well. Uh, if you write something poorly uh, in your first prototype of JavaScript or first prototype of Node, I don't think anybody's going to be very impressed and want to move to it. Um, so, so make sure you understand what you're doing when you're when you're writing that prototype. Uh, show off the prototype. Show show the show the code. Do a, a code review on it, or show off some stats on what you can do. Um, hope for the best, and then uh, profit. Um, so. So this, this should show two things, really. How fast a prototype can be stood up, as well as how fast and stable a Node application can be. Um, if you've ever been on the Node.js uh, uh, website, this is on their front page. This is a, a very powerful concept to wrap your head around. This uh, starts up a server and responds to hello world. Um, that's, that's great, but it doesn't do anything. You can could, you could impress people with how many requests per seconds this gets. I'll do it in a second. Um, but it really doesn't do anything. So think about, think about your prototype. Don't just say, hey, I wrote a Node.js server. This is awesome. Uh, so I want to show a prototype off of kind of what I, what, what I would build out right now if I, if I needed to build a prototype, right? So these are some frameworks that, um, that I'm using in this prototype. Uh, Nex or Conex, uh, not sure how they really wanted to um, uh, pronounce that, but I kind of go back and forth on either one. Uh, this is kind of bootstrap the entire database and also seed the database with uh, data. Bookshelf uh, is an ORM. Uh, this is used to create uh, models for our API. HappyJS, uh, this is a server framework. This is kind of like your Express. Uh, I we are we are moving to uh, use Happy and in, in all of our stack. Um, this is, this got famous because it was built by the people who work at Walmart, and they survived um, they survived Black Friday for all mobile traffic uh, using the Happy framework um, on I think it was a machine with a couple cores and a 20 or so gigs of RAM. It was, it was a very small, I, don't quote me on that, um, but it was a very small amount of, of resources used, and uh, I think they had 55 or so percent of their traffic being mobile. So it's, um, it's a very stable framework, uh, and, and I love it. Uh, Joy is a schema validation framework um, built by Happy, and they have, uh, so, so validating post objects or what have you uh, very easily, and then Lout, is a documentation um, generator. Uh, everybody loves to write documentation, and so what this does is uh, it takes the schema from Joy and the routes that you build out and build out entire documentation of, of, your, of your server. So um, that's really cool. I'll show that too. So hey, it's demo time. OK, so let's uh, go. Oh, no. Wrong way. OK. so. Have to forgive me. I have to bend my head on this one. So this is the Node application. So what I want to do first, uh, man, I can't see with anything. Okay. So this is uh, I'll just call it Next. So um, this is a Next migration script, and what this does, if you see, uh, it builds a, it creates a table named Company Employee. Uh, task and assign task, and there's some um, relationships there too. So if I go on to here, I'm in my database folder, so you can see that. Uh, go connect. Yeah. Burp. Oh, so you see the prototype dot SQLite there. I'm just going to blow that away. So that created the SQLite database. Uh, this can also connect to MySQL, Postgres. Um, but, but right now I'm using SQLite just because it's pretty easy. Uh, can also do uh, seed.run. 
and that that runs the seed file, uh, seed file, which is right here. And all that does is clear out the tables. And man, this I'm sorry, this uh, I can't really see where I'm going. There we go. Hey, and then it just kind of builds some test data out, right? So now you have an entire database that's ready to go. So if I step back out here, node app, cross fingers, hey, there we go. Um, so we have, let me go over here, sorry. Jumping back and forth between screens is not fun, I'll tell you. So we'll, uh, of course. Oh, it's creating over here. Awesome. <laughs> Shared screen problems here. So uh, just to show you that we do have a real database. So there's the API route for a company, a specific company, and just for grins, any employee that's in that company uh, where Punzel and Flynn Rider got in there. So, uh, so what's interesting about this, and once again, forgive me, my uh, view of the screen is, is messy. Uh, so here's your views. This is how you create an actual route. Uh, there's a basic CRUD uh, operations here, uh, giving you a, so method, path, the, the handler that goes into the controller. And this, this config area is actually uh, part for the, um, for the documentation. Um, very cool stuff, uh, I think. It's also a little pretty um, minimal code. If you've built some stuff out in, uh, in Express or using um, um, using just straight SQL queries. Uh, so here's kind of the joy validation um, object that it creates. Uh, so if you're, if you're posting to something, it'll make sure that there's an ID, uh, well, they can't post an ID, that the employee ID is a, is a number, task ID is a number, what have you. Uh, so we'll move up here. So here's, here's a model, which is, which is very nice, because we, we started out just writing SQL, and, and that got pretty ugly pretty quick. And so this is actually just defining the table name, uh, defining some relationships between that. So, um, and I believe this is the assigned task, which is not really fun. It just has a couple foreign, foreign IDs. Uh, but I'm, I'm having a difficult time looking at all this stuff, so I don't want to just bore you to death with this stuff. Uh, so yeah. so. Uh, Really easy setup for the, actually, I want to show you the app. Um, I'm just guessing here, yeah. So really easy setup. You see we instantiate a server and uh, start the server down here. The stuff in the middle is just some uh, plugins. So you can see we're doing a, a lout plugin. There's a uh, promise plugin. So instead of having to wait for a response and uh, validate that response, you can actually just if you reply with a promise, it'll resolve that promise and send the um, send the information out to the to the client. So, uh, so really nice stuff here. Let me uh, let me go here to show you kind of the docs. Um, so this gives you all of the routes that we created, and it's not showing, but this also gives you the payload parameters. Uh, for for like a put or um, for a delete. So um, it's it's really powerful that I didn't have to write any kind of documentation code. It just created it from from the stuff that it already knows. So uh, that's also something you could really show off to a, a, a boss is um, this took no time. Most of the time they just say, oh, don't write documentation because you have to go into the next thing. So write documentation and you don't have to do a whole lot to write documentation. So that's very nice. Um, we're going to jump over here 
and just for for grins, I also have that. Uh, there that is. I also have that node uh, example app uh, on the front. So that's running on 1337. I want to do just a little bit of a load test just to show you kind of how, how fun this is. So uh, I use uh, node load, which is just a um, command line interface to, to do massive requests. Um, not a whole lot because I'm on my computer and I don't want to completely crash the thing. So this is just one uh, one concurrent user and uh, request per second. We're getting into there's like 6,100 requests per second. Uh, obviously, as I said before, this is the node example. It does nothing, so it doesn't really do you any good to say, "Hey, look how fast I can do." That's that's that kind of creates a, a false sense of how amazing your application could be, right? So then we'll just go and play around with this company. And you're going to see a lot slower, uh, less amount of requests per second for a concurrent user. So around 800. Uh, but mind you, this is actually going into a SQLite database, doing a query, all file system stuff. Um, adding concurrent users, as easy as that. So just 10, nothing bad. Uh, it gets up to about, you know. A thousand or so, depending on the the load of the system. So that is uh, one application running on a single core, a uh, single threaded application. Um, pretty good amount of requests per second on just a a, a Mac. So um, so yay! Congratulations. We we built a prototype uh, and an actual useful prototype. I, I would I would. Um, Recommend if you go down this road that, that you do build a useful prototype that, that has some data back there, that has some business logic. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. So uh, let me try to dance around getting this up and running again. So demo time, there we go. So code can be found here for that uh, uh, example. I'm going to have code for the slides later um, also. So if, if you want to see that, uh, later, by all means, um, I'll leave the code for the slides up, and so you can get to that. Okay, so yay, we have success. Uh, we're all excited. Uh, and then someone says, okay, yeah, yeah, go push that into production, and then you get really scared because it's success. And now you know that you really have to uh, put this out in the wild, and you're the one that said we should do this, so uh, it's going to be on you, right? So when the rubber meets the, m the road, you're going to have to push through all the problems that you find. Uh, don't be afraid of starting over. Uh, you're you're kind of doing that already with, with going to Node, uh, starting to develop something brand new. Uh, don't be afraid to say, you know what, we were going down this road uh, and we, we have to kind of stop because we found something better. I know that's, that's going to be tough because there's a cost, an added cost up front for that, but you're going to, in the end, um, have, a, have a better return on investment if, if it is the right decision to make. I, I'm not saying go hop around on different frameworks because uh, you know this one person tweeted that it's really awesome. Uh, but, but do be very um, mindful of, of the, the frameworks you choose and, and what you use. Um, and, then, and then problems. These, these problems are going to happen. I, I encourage that you shouldn't let this discourage you. Um, I had I, I dealt with a lot of discouragement uh, in my initial production pushes of Node. Uh, there were a lot of problems, and there were a lot of times where I really questioned whether or not we should have done this. Um, but you know what? It's not Node's fault. It's it it rarely is never Node's fault for for the problems that you're running into. Um, it's most likely the understanding of Node. At least in, in, my, in my use cases, it was because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so, so don't question your decision on the issues you run into. Just, just deal with them and improve your code and inc uh, improve your understanding of, of really what you should be doing. So um, just an example, uh, our first Node app, it had a, a little bug with it uh, on, on MySQL connections. Uh, and we had a connection leak. And so once we hit the MySQL max connection, connections, 
uh, on the uh, database server, the application did absolutely nothing. And um, we didn't run into this until production because the test database had a whole lot more max connections and a shorter time to live. And so those, those connection leaks uh, happened to, uh, to go away really quick in the test database. Um, and I, I blamed the, uh, the module owner of Node. I said, I, I can't believe this isn't being handled properly kind of thing. Well, that, it was all my fault. Uh, so, so yeah, don't, don't assume that it's someone else's problem. It's, it's most likely yours because a lot of these, uh, these modules that, that are coming out are, are very stable. They are being used across the board. So, so find those problems and really, really push through those problems and, and it really will improve the code that you're writing. Uh, so common problems, uh, handling event loops and callback hell. You could really get into some ugly code if you keep on uh, going down the path of, uh, if you've ever seen the um, curly bracket uh, boomerang, um, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, ugly code is not maintainable, especially with JavaScript. Uh, that's why a lot of people say, hey, JavaScript's not maintainable. Well, write better code and, and you can probably maintain JavaScript uh, a whole lot better. Uh, so it's, it, you have to be thoughtful when you're writing the code, but at the end of the day, when you write that code and you see that code, understand it and have someone else understand it a lot better, uh, it, it's much easier to follow. Um, memory leaks, handling errors, maxing out CPU, network I.O. bounds, and as I said before, database connections queries. You know, what you write affects the server. This is true for any language, um, but you could take down a server real quick with Node. Um, trust me, it's happened. Uh, it's, it happens to, to everybody. If you're not pushing the limits on Node, then, I mean, um, you're, you're probably, I'm not saying you're not, you're not doing it right or you're doing it wrong, but um, you, have to, you have to see, you, you have to see how, how, um, how far you go, how far you can take the, the, the machine that you're running Node on, and, and then you'll really start to understand what you can do with that code. Uh, node is not a silver bullet, um, and you can absolutely do stupid stuff in mode. Monitor applications. Um, that's, that's, that's something that really um, helped us out along the way, is to really see where performance is hit, where, what memory is being used, what CPU is being used, where you can um, go, that, uh, go down that road a little bit better. Uh, so as a developer, you're going to need to develop, deploy, handle scale, monitor, clean up all your messes, uh, plus a whole lot more. Uh, I kind of ran into this uh, a lot because with Node and especially with maybe um, uh, people who maintain servers, if another team maintains servers and, and production environments, uh, there might be a lot less knowledge on Node. And so if a problem occurs in the node application, you're probably going to be called upon, especially if you were the one that had that crazy idea to move to node. Uh, so you'll, you'll have to clean up those messages. You'll have to find out what's wrong. So a, a few tools to help, uh, Chrome Dev Tools, uh, testing frameworks to, to test the heck out of your code. You should really do that. Um, handle errors, whether it be user, server, or um, unrecoverable errors and then log as much as possible. Um, so, so you can do that um, what went wrong scenarios or find out what's going right if it's good. Um, so your, your application just on its own, as I showed you before, it should handle a decent amount of load. Uh, but just doing node app.js uh, and doing like an and and or something, um, I guess it's node app.js and percent, uh, and starting it up or um, is, is not the best way to go. So, so what we found the f initially is how, how do we better do application monitoring and deployment. Uh, so unlike PHP, you just can't drop files on a server uh, and, and you're good, you're golden. You just made updates or get checkout and you made updates. Uh, you want close to 100% uptime as possible. Uh, use the available cores of the machine. I was just showing you one application running and that just used one core of an eight core machine. 
uh, have really good logging outside of um, outside of what what really you're doing. Uh, scriptable monitoring. Uh, also, forever start app is not the greatest solution. I think it was very serviceable for for where it was uh, and at the beginning, and and really had to grow up a little bit and find a uh, find a better solution. Um, and that solution for us was PN2. Uh, I'll prop up Carl Kirch. Uh, he works for WDT. Uh, he did a lightning talk on this for OKCJS and Spring Beta. So if you go out and find Carl's GitHub, uh, his handle is Joe Carl. Um, he has some really good insights on PM2. And you can always hit him up on Twitter or anything like that. He has a lot of great knowledge on, on Node. So PM2, uh, built-in load balancer using the cluster module, uh, script daemonization, zero second downtime reload. Uh, you can generate startup scripts, so if your server goes down and comes right back up, it'll restart everything. Uh, you can pause or stop unstable processes very easily. Monitoring console, and then uh, combined logging. So from there, let's go with another demo. Uh, OK. Whoa, no. OK, so what we have here is there's our node app. So you can actually do a PN2 start app and then uh, give it the number of cores that you want to use. I'm going to use five because I don't want to take down my, um, my computer. I know node load uses a core or two, and so I don't want to just completely freeze up here. So we're going to start that up. As you can see, it, it, it creates uh, all these uh, uh, fun instances of the application, and then on top of it, it load balances the request coming in. So if I do PM2 monit, you can actually see uh, the memory usage and the CPU usage. So we're going to do some jumping back and forth here just for fun. Uh, clear up here? Oh. oh, so it goes all the way up? Yes, sir. So we'll clear that. There we go. Sorry about that. OK, so uh, we'll run the same thing, just 10 concurrent users. And you can see uh, we're up to about 23, 2,500 uh, requests per second on, on that. Uh, you can see we're kind of maxing out the CPUs. Uh, so you can kind of see how it's, how it's performing a little bit. Uh, if you wanted to um, dive in a little bit more, you can. Uh, I don't know, connect to uh, like a new relic or something like that. They have a lot of stuff or, or take memory profile snapshots or what have you. Um, but this is a good start to see, OK, my, my cores are being used. I probably need to bump up a little bit in, in machine. Memory is pretty good, uh, but want to make sure I'm not you know, hitting that crazily. So, um, uh, so we'll go back to, uh, to this. Still running nice and smoothly. Um, so, so yeah. So what what you've seen there is without any change of code or anything like that, just using the available cores on a machine. Not even the available cores. Five cores of an eight-core machine. Uh, you get probably about uh, five times. Oh, that makes sense. Um, so yeah. So that's I, I think uh, PN2 is a very powerful. Uh, module uh, that, that we've used that has really improved how, um, how stable and how much more performance we can get out of our applications. So now let's try to go back to presentation. Hey, yay. OK, so uh, continuous integration and deployment. Uh, there we go. Um, so this is true for any uh, language. Uh, if, if you take this one away, this would be great for you to take. Uh, of you need to find ways, you should find ways to try to inject that kind of stuff into your workflow. Um, what do we use? Uh, Grunt, Jenkins, Nexus, NPM, Lite. And I'll get to that NPM Lite just in a second. Uh, Grunt uh, is a task manager. Uh, build, minify JavaScript, linting. Um, uh, all sorts of things, basically. Uh, any, anything that we do for uh, automation, we'll, we'll use Grunt as the task runner. 
Uh, Jenkins is for building testing software projects continuously. So when you push anything, push your code to the server, it triggers a build on Jenkins. Uh, so Jenkins will actually call the, the grunt test. So everything is in grunt, but Jenkins is kind of the, the management of all those jobs. Um, so what, what we use in there is either deploy the application to the server, or we'll save to a repo manager, which is next, uh, which is Nexus. Uh, it's a repository and artifact management uh, server. Uh, lucky enough, it can save tarballs, which is uh, what NPM can install from. So if you have a URL from there, you can actually NPM install from this private artifact management system that's running on your internal server. Uh, problem that we had with it is that's a, just a massive URL, and putting that in a package JSON file is pretty pretty gnarly. So uh, Devin Clark, uh, a, a guy on our team, he he wrote this NPM Lite, um, and it is it uses the Nexus API to shorten the artifact request just down to npmwcom slash project name slash uh, a range. So what that does is, if you've used NPM, uh, you can give it a, um, a, a SimVer range, and it will find what match, what version matches up the the best, if you will, uh, for that, and then download that tarball, uh, which is very powerful, and it really helps us out in our in our deployment. It's also the first WT application written in Happy, so. Um, so that's something that really got us started down on Happy. Uh, Devin actually did a presentation for a lightning talk on Happy, if, if you want to go check that out. Um, so move more towards a stable node environment. Um, you know, from, from git clone pull and forever start app to an automated deployment, testing with Mocha, ORM to create a model. Uh, we're migrating from Express to Happy, utilizing PM and Lite, and using PM2. Um, you're not going to start out in this perfect world with Node. You, you probably have to get started, uh, kind of uh, scratch your way through, but then find, uh, find what you need to look at improve the most in your workflow on whether it's uh, automated deployment or monitoring or testing or what have you. But start, start pulling off those small chunks. Uh, there's a whole lot of tools out there to help you. Uh, and, and don't just jump at any tool, uh, but, but be mindful of what you choose. So uh, also, you just don't have to know Node. You just jump in and start playing around. I think it's a, it is a, a I love the language. I, I love JavaScript. Um, and so um, I'm here to say it's, it's really fun once you get into there and, and start to understand how powerful it can be. Um, so I'll, I'll finish there. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, there's where you can get the slides. Um, there's my contact information. Um, if you don't have questions now and, and you want to chat later, Twitter or, or email or, or what have you, pull requests, I, I don't really care. Just, I, I'm, always, I'm always willing to, to talk about this stuff. So, so please, any questions? Yes, sir. It was a, um, huh. <laughs> uh, we went to a, a more robust prototype um, and, and showed that off. So spent a, a, a good amount of development effort to create an API around that, um, knowing that we could fall back on a, a PHP that we knew we're familiar with, like, like a, uh, sorry, a language that we are familiar with, like PHP. Uh, so, um, so kind of risky way of doing it uh, by by creating the node side of things. Uh, we still had to create the entire uh, front end, so that really didn't do a whole lot to um, get us along the way. But but we were able to build the back end, knowing that we could fall back on something like uh, like PHP. If, if it wasn't. But once it was fully, once it was baked enough to show off the demo and prototype, uh, it, was, it was a pretty, pretty easy decision for them to make. Um, also, just um, sharing the knowledge of, of, of what you're learning with, the manage, with management. Um, just, just being able to show off, hey, you know, here's, here's some examples of other things that, that can be done. And, uh, 
here's what other folks are doing in, in the world. And you know, there, there's so much stuff out on GitHub that you can uh, easily clone and, and, and start up a server in, in no time that, that does something useful um, that, that you can show that to without a whole lot of work to be done. Yes, sir. Uh, question was, what's the turnaround time? Uh, it's pitching the idea to implementation. I think that depends on the organization. Obviously, if, if there's, uh, if your prototype is a, is a very tiny piece of a gigantic legacy application, it's going to be a little bit slower moving. Uh, but showing the improvements on that might, might get the development efforts going. Um, so what our, our experience was it was a um, full rewrite of an entire web application that we had to do. It was going to have to be done anyways, and so that was a great time to say, okay, well, let's, let's prototype this out, let's build this out in a way that, that makes the most sense. So um, I would say it depends, but I think um, depending on um, how fast moving the, the organization is can, can really help out. Anybody else? All right, thank you for your time.